and he has been one of the most prolific uh, researchers in our field in programming languages, software engineering, and computer security. And mostly he worked on program analysis, software security, binary analysis, a lot of other things. Recently he has also moved into reliable AI, uh, I guess following Martin's footsteps. And uh, so Xiang Yu has won like uh, I mean, a long list of awards. Like uh, Michael, uh, Mike, Mike, Mike Hicks, he also won the ACM uh, Outstanding Dissertation Award. Uh, ACM SIG Plan Outstanding Dissertation Award, and a long list of uh, distinguished paper awards, best paper awards at security conferences, software engineering conferences, and uh, probably some other conferences that I've missed. Okay, so let's hear from Xiang Yu. Hmm? What's that? Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some uh, our recent work on uh, using program analysis and uh, software engineering technique to uh, solve some of the AI problems following uh, Martin's steps. Uh, uh, AI-driven computing has become a trend. Um, so AI model is an uh, integral part of many applications. For example, autonomous vehicles, uh, Apple Face ID, iRobots, you know, Cortana, you know, the AI by Microsoft, and also you know, computer games, they all have AI components, right? And people actually start to share and reuse AI models, um, just like you know, software components. For example, the Python face recognition package allows you to embed the face recognition capability in many applications. And then there are also a lot of uh, online reposts, such as a big ML, OpenML, Gradient Zoo, that allow people to publish and reuse uh, uh, AI models. So to engineer this kind of AI-driven system, uh, developers have to follow steps like implementation, and then evaluation, and then you're gonna do a lot of tuning, debugging, optimization, just pretty similar to a traditional software development process, right? And then what we're saying here is that AI model are equally prone to box and vulnerability, just like the traditional uh, software components. <clears throat> so here we can talk about traditional uh, engineering box, like coding box, data clean, uh, cleaning box, and data format box, uh, misbehave uh, data partitioning, and so on. There's also a new kind of uh, problems, we call the model box. Here we define them as uh, misconducts in the AI model, engineering process leading to undesirable consequences. Of course, uh, this definition is very broad, very general, but look at the root causes. That could be because of the um, um, bias, training data, defective model structure, or you know you have suboptimal type of parameters and the wrongly chosen algorithms and things like that, right? If you look at the symptoms of this kind of bugs, they could be you know causing like a undesirably low model accuracies, or they are vulnerable to adversary attacks, just like Martin showed yesterday, right? <clears throat> so for example, recently it was reported that the state of art. Uh, Pre-trained model can only achieve 80% accuracy on the ImageNet uh, classification challenge, which is an object uh, recognition challenge. And a state-of-art NLP uh, model can only achieve 73% accuracy on a children's book test challenge. And then researchers actually found out that this pre-trained model have a suboptimal con configuration, and then they went ahead, uh, made the changes, and they found out that accuracy actually got substantially improved. And then the presence of model box are also demonstrated by uh, numerous attacks on, uh, on AI systems. You know, many of them have been shown um, in Martin's talk, then I will use, we not go, go in there. So we say that, okay, AI models have bugs, but debugging is hard, right? 
Uh, there are a number of reasons. The first one is that you know, deep networks actually are not human understandable, interpretable. Right? So each neuron is supposed to denote some kind of abstract feature, but such features are very difficult to describe by humans. And then we lack the scientific methods to locate the root cause of the problem. Right? Could be because of suboptimal architecture of your, your, your model. It could be the bias of training inputs. Which one is the problem? Right? In practice, developers usually do try and error. Right? They kind of, OK, I've got to add more input into my training set, see what happens. Or I'm going to switch to another uh, architecture or change my uh, you know, configuration, things like that. So let's say even you're able to identify the root cause, there were certain features or neurons in your uh, model that actually caused the misbehavior. Then how do you fix them? Right? <clears throat> you cannot directly just change the wave values, just like you change the code in the software components. Right? And then uh, you cannot simply just add a failing inducing input into your training set. Hopefully, that will fix your problem. Okay? So it's unknown. So the theme of my talk is that uh, we have been working on this uh, more than one year, and then now uh, we want to process some of our experience in leveraging the, uh, what we have learned in program analysis and, and software engineering to open the box and look inside, look into the internals of the network and see what, uh, what can we do. Shall you quick question? I mean, why can't you just fix the weights if you care about the end? I mean, at the end, you care about the trend model, right? If you know how to fix the weights. Yep. So potentially, you can use simple analysis to fix the weight, but uh, there's a scalability problem there, which I can go into that uh, later. Yeah. <clears throat> So I will talk about two things. One is called MODE, Automated Neural Network Model Debugging and uh, via State Differential Analysis and Input Selection. These two keywords probably, engineers must be very familiar with these two keywords, Differential Analysis and Input Selection. Uh, this will appear in FSC this year. And then the second one is AML, AMI, Attack Meets Interpretability, Attribute Steer Detection of Other Rules Samples. So let me first talk about the, the MODE, which is the debugging work. Uh, to start this project, we actually have a student downloaded many uh, pre-trained models from the internet and study what kind of problems uh, those models may have. Uh, here are some of our observations. One big category of this book actually are input related. And then the first one, the most prominent one, is called the bias training input. Essentially, the training input is not a good approximation of the real distribution. Okay? As a result, you may have overfitting and underfitting. Right? Overfitting means that your model is overtrained on specific inputs, so it doesn't work well for other inputs. And then the underfitting bug actually means that your model is not even well trained. It doesn't extract the important features, and then it doesn't work well. Um, that's one. And then we also found there are problems. For example, uh, we call it the inclusion of problematic inputs in a training set lead to difficulty of convergence. So we have downloaded one model, and this model is to, uh, to do one simple task. Try to evaluate the propositional logic expression. For example, you have an expression like T, uh, disjoint with F and conjoint with T, and you go to the model, and then you want to predict is the true or false. You know that this is a simple problem with a deterministic algorithm. There exists a ground truth a model with 100% provable accuracy. Okay? So however, we were not able to, uh, no matter how hard we tried, different model uh, configuration, different architecture, we just cannot converge on a perfect model. So we found out there were some inputs in the, in the, in the training, training set. We call them the, the toxic input. If we remove them, we are able to get the 100% uh, accuracy. Okay? And then we also found there are models that have problematic input embeddings. Em embeddings are important for recurrent ne uh, neural network, right? So essentially, it's the vectorized representation of a specific word. And then an important assumption about I and N is that a similar embedding should entail similar semantics. However, this assumption usually is violated. For example, if we use a pre-trained embedding like the one that word 2 vec or Google embedding in addressing a problem for example, understanding the text in a software document usually doesn't work well because, uh, you know, in the context of software, soft documents, you have this, uh, for example, the word new and create actually have similar semantics, but they have a different embeddings, right? And the second uh, category of bugs we have found essentially are the structural bugs. Uh, for example, you may have redundant layers, neurons, or insufficient layers, neurons. Um, for example, there's some research showing that 60%, 70% of the neurons or layers actually are not needed. Okay? So we also find that in some cases, even the uh, architecture or the structure of the model is ineffective. For example, 
Uh, forget gay is an important uh, capability in uh, LSTM, long short term memory models. And these forget gay are supposed to retain or forget certain, in, uh, certain contextual information. Right? But we found that in some applications, this forget gay completely not working. Okay, it forget the important things and keep the completely not important things. <clears throat> uh, there are certain things uh, 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 probably you have encountered when you're training models is that the suboptimal setting of reward values could lead to extremely long training uh, time in reinforcement learning. So here I show you a few videos. In this project, we actually try to train a photo tolerant uh, controller with AI to completely replace the, uh, the PID controller in a drone. This is a, a project with Navy. And then, to begin with, we have a suboptimal reward setting. We train it for two weeks. You can see that this drone actually doesn't really converge on any stable controller, okay? So the drone just fly off the screen all the time, even after two, two weeks trainings. And then we spend a lot of time uh, to, to tune the, uh, the, the reward setting. So at the end, we have uh, one setting allow us to train just for four hours, and then we have a, a stable controller, a four tolerant controller. You can see that any perturbation to the drone, it can quickly, the controller can quickly uh, bring it back to the stable position. Right? So the lesson we learned here is that the global optimal for this particular problem is actually in a very tiny space. It's very difficult to find that, that global optimal uh, uh, solution, and then it requires a very specific uh, reward setting. However, of course, uh, these are all the observations. Okay? Today what we are talking about is um, how we actually adjust the first problem, the most prominent one, the bias uh, uh, training input problem, okay? underfitting and overfitting. So we say that a model has underfitting bug because uh, when you have some output uh, label, both the training and test accuracy are lower than a threshold T. And this threshold T is a uh, domain specific. For example, if you do digit recognition, this T could be like as high as 95% because the simplicity of the task. But if you are working on some complex task like the sentiment analysis in natural language processing, then this T could be um, like 85% because it's more difficult. <clears throat> and then we say a model has an overfitting bug if for some output label its training accuracy is higher than a test accuracy by at least some threshold, okay? That means uh, you, you overfit on the training input, but it doesn't work well on the, on the, on the test. <clears throat> so there was existing efforts. They mainly actually focus on generating new inputs. For example, you could predefine a number of uh, input transformation, like uh, rotating the, the image, mirror the image, clip the image, to generate more images to put into the uh, training set. And you could also use a generated model to collect more data points. For example, you can use a variational autoencoder or generated adversary net again to generate new input and put into the training set. So however, we've, we found that using this GAN actually is not that effective. So we have done an experiment. We downloaded 14 uh, again models from uh, various sources to work on the uh, missed data set. And then for each scan, we actually randomly select 40,000 uh, generated inputs as the additional input into the uh, uh, data set. And then this model actually has an underfitting bug for digit five, uh, which only has 74% accuracy. However, we found that Seven out of 14 actually failed to improve either the digit five or the entire model. And four of them improved the model, but not digit five. Only three of them actually improved both. But the improvement actually is pretty low. Uh, can only get to 83% after one hour training. So in contrast, our technique, which is called mode, can improve to 40, 94% in five minutes. So the root cause is that this kind of uh, randomly selected, newly generated input doesn't look into the reason why this neural network is misbehaving. Okay. <clears throat> you look at some of the images generated by the, by the uh, GAN network, you can see that this three may be helpful, but look at the other three you add in into the training set. They probably can only confuse the neural network. Right? <clears throat> so um, then we look into how software debugging is performed and then try to learn some uh, lessons from there, which we can port to the uh, a new scenario. Traditionally, when you run the input through the program, you have some failures. And then what people do is they do this uh, so-called state 
state differential analysis, right? On one hand, you have the failing run. On the other hand, you may have a reference. This could be a passing run, just like in the uh, Delta debugging, or something in your mind. You compare the two, you identify the 40 states, right? And from the 40 states, you provide some kind of a causal analysis to identify the root cause, and then go ahead and fix the root cause, right? That's uh, uh, what we have uh, established in the practice of software debugging. Now, what we want to do in this scenario is try to do something similar. Right? We run the input through the models, then you have the correctly classified results, and you also have the misclassification. Then we can compare the internals of these two kind of uh, uh, cases, right? See how the behavior of the neural network differed for the correctly classified cases and the misclassified cases. And then we identify the so-called the 40 features. You can think of some of the neuron may have uh, problematic weights. Okay, and then since it's difficult for us to directly change the weight values, and then the way that we fix the problem is to use the 40 features as the guidance to select new inputs to put into our training set, right, to improve the, the, the performance of our network. So this is just a repetition of what I just said. An important concept here is called the differential heat map. You can think of this differential heat map is a something that we compute for each hidden layer. So each pixel of this differential heat map tell you the importance uh, of that particular neuron or feature for the buggy behavior. Okay? Here the red color means that it's actually very dangerous. It's important for the buggy behavior. Right? So I will explain how to compute it and then uh, uh, the, the proper definition of heat map. So let me spend a little, bit, little more time on def defining this concept of heat map. So um, heat map essentially is a matrix that represents the importance of each neuron in the hidden layer. We have one heat map for each hidden layer. So here we say that each neuron denotes some kind of an abstract feature. So we typically visualize this heat map. We have one pixel to denote the importance of one neuron. The red color represents that it's positively important. What it means is that the presence of the feature is important for the classification result. Okay? The blue color is called the negative importance. It means that the absence of the feature is important for the classification result. Okay? And then the, the white color means that's neutral. Okay? <clears throat> so you can see that I show you a bunch of a heat map for the different digit. You can see that for this digit zero, right, the red part, the important part, the positive important part, kind of have the shape of uh, digit zero. Question? Yeah. yeah so Shang this is different from whether a neuron is activated or not. Uh, right, it's different. <clears throat> so you can see that uh, uh, digit one, right, this part is actually is important for the classification of one. And there was some blue part here that means that you shouldn't have any digit at this location, otherwise it causes confusion, okay? <clears throat> and then uh, let me use a motivating example to, to kind of uh, quickly give you a, a understanding of our technique. Let's say you have a model which have underfitting uh, bug for label one. So you misclassify this uh, number four and number A as digit one. So what we compute is a number of heat map. We have a benign heat map that tell you the important features for the correct classification of digit one. Okay? And we compute a 40 heat map which tell you the important features for the misclassification of digit one. Then we subtract the benign heat map from the 40 heat map, we get a differential heat map. And this differential heat map tell you, the red color tell you the important uh, neuron or features for the uh, misclassification, right? Now with that information, so what kind of input we should select? We should select the samples that fall into the blue region because they are important for the correct classification. And then we should preclude the samples that fall into the red region because they tend to cause the misclassification, right? You look at some of the, the data set. You have some of these samples. They are di digit one samples, but even human can hardly tell they are you know, digit one or digit seven, right? That indeed cause the confusion. And then uh, differential HEMA actually tell you this is the confusing part, right? Okay? <clears throat> All right. 
Now uh, I spend a little more time explaining how we compute the heat map. Uh, the first thing we think of, oh, can we use the gradient information, right? However, that gradient essentially tell you how much the output changes can be induced by the wave value changes. They are regarding with respect to the wave values. However, our importance is res uh, with respect to the feature, the neuron, or the activation values, right? These are kind of a different concepts in some sense. And then the importance measures how much influence a feature has on the classification result on the output uh, label. As a consequence, important features may not have wave values that offer a large gradient. Here, look, take a look at this example. You have this red area. That tells us the important feature. But this feature may not have a uh, associated wave value that have large gradients. Or this region actually is not sensitive, right? You make changes here, they may not cause the output changes. Okay, these are different concepts. So then we come up with a different way to computing it. So take a look at this uh, the diagram on the top. We have a model, and then we are interested in computing the heat map for this uh, uh, light blue hidden layer. So what we do is that we construct a new model, so called the feature model. We kind of retain all the layers up to this light blue layer, okay? Retain, freeze all the wave values up to this layer. And then we introduce a new, uh, a new uh, soft, uh, softmax layer, linking this uh, light blue layer to the output, okay? <coughs> then we retrain this feature model on the input. Only retrain the last layer, which is the, the, new, the new output layer. And then after training, the weights of the last layer indeed measure the importance of individual features. Okay? Any questions? So, in other words, we use the normalized weights for an output label of the newly trained softmax layer as the heat map. We normalize it to minus one to one with the absolute values denote the importance and then the signs denote the positive or negative importance. Okay. Just, just a question, like to make sure. And since so the mm -hmm. so the softmax give you like a distribution over the labels, right? Mm -hmm. And then you normalize this uh, yeah. into some range. Right. And then how do I get like the the features somehow from the importance? There? Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. If you think about the, our soft, softmax layer, it's some kind of a more complex logistic regression. Mm -hmm. If you're doing regression on the activation value on my light blue layer, right? And then isn't that after training, after convergence, your, your parameter values, the B0, B1, B2, the coefficients, I essentially tell you the importance or the contributions of individual uh, activation value. I just meant like, what is the output? Is it like a mate, like for every neuron you have a weight now after the, after the process or? Uh, for each neuron, I have a weight for each. It's, think of each of these is a wave value, right? Mm -hmm. And then my heat map for this output label, essentially all the uh, green edges. So it's basically for, for every pair of a output label and neuron, there is a weight. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, normalized uh, by output label, yes. How do you deal with bias terms? Bias. Usually, the green connections for the weights represent a matrix multiplication plus the addition of the bias vector. Right. Because of matrix multiplication, what is the of the bias term? I think this is the last layer, softmax uh, soft layer, I guess. Um, I need to think about that. So uh, this is how we compute a differential heat map. And then uh, next I will quickly go through how we, how we compute a differential heat map. Right? We just explain how to compute heat map, then we need a differential heat map for, for our debugging. So for example, for underfitting box, there were two kind of uh, root causes for underfitting. The first one is that the S extracted features cannot fully represent the uniqueness of the target label. Right? In this case, what we want to do is we want to select the cases that can emphasize the uniqueness. And the second uh, possible reason is that the cases misclassified to the target label uh, may share some common features with the, uh, some of the uh, cases of the target label. And then we want to preclude these confusing uh, cases. Right? 
So then for, for this uh, root cause one, we compute a uh, differential heat map like this. This is a differential heat map for label L. L is the problematic label. And then it's, it's the uh, difference between the heat map of L subtract by the heat map of K, okay? So when the difference of this two heat map is minimum. What does it mean? Intuitively, it says that it represents the minimum similarity of a particular feature F, okay, regarding the target label L and some other label, uh, upper label, right? So what does it tell you? The larger the value, the more unique feature this one is, right? Okay, does that make sense? If not, let's take a look at this example. In this one, I have a heat map for digit one, I have a heat map for digit two, and then this differential heat map really tell me what is unique for digit one regarding digit two, right? Okay? And then with that, what input should I select? I should select the unique one, I should select the one that covered the, uh, the red region, and then try to weaken uh, the presence of those that have the presence in the blue area, okay? So this is almost what you wrote before is like an optimization objective. You can train with this. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. So on the previous slide, you had like on the previous slide, you had this uh, differential heat map. So yep. is this an objective? This is a measure, right, of some kind. Right, trying measure. to minimize. Right. So you can train with this. Uh, we train we train the heat map individually. Then we compute it out out of. Uh, the yeah, but after you have it, you can right. You can you can train then continue train the network to optimize for this. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. We haven't thought about this. Yeah, we simply use it for for input selection. Hmm. What, what the training for that mean? Minimizing the differential. Could be. Yeah. But why is that a meaningful thing? Well, because that's what he's measuring here, right? And then he removes well, inputs to try to minimize that, right? But, but Selection, you also get the label if you just optimize for it. You don't know what the label is. I mean, there, there's some extra information if you use it for input selection. No, no, but you, ha you have the labels with the, with the data set already. So, anyway, yeah, I think it could be a good idea. Yeah. You need to think about that. <clears throat> so, for the second case, um, which is, uh, there are misclassified cases that share common uh, features. The differential heat map we compute is that. For this differential heat map, we, we use the heat map for the cases that are misclassified as L to subtract the, differential, the, the heat map of the correctly classified as L. So what does it mean? Intuitively, a large value indicates that the feature is critical for the misclassification, right? <clears throat> Let's take a look at example. So we have a heat map for digit one and they have the heat map for all the cases that are misclassified as one. <coughs> then when you take the subtraction, then this heat map tell you what? The conf confusing features, right? So, and then what we have to do is that we focus on the blue areas and try to avoid the, the red area. <coughs> now all fitting box actually have a different root cause. So typically they mean narrow scope training data or the model is too large so that you have too much capacity and the model start to remember instead of a generalize, right? Uh, or you train with too many epochs. Then what you want to do is they want to add more diverse training data to the target, uh, for the target label. So differential heat map computes like this. We compute the maximum difference between the heat map for the cases, for the L cases that are misclassified as K, some other label and the cases that correctly classify as L. Intuitively, what does it mean? It means that a large value denotes the feature that's responsible for the misclassification of L to K. In other words, you have some features of L that, that hasn't been recognized by, by the model, right? So what do we have to do? Then we want more samples that demonstrate such features, right? Okay, that's different from uh, solving the uh, and the fitting bar. Now take a look at example. I have a heat map for, for zero, and I have a, also have a heat map for zero that are misclassified as something else. Now what's the difference? You take a subtraction, you can see that this red region tell you the features that we should generalize. The blue area tell you the uh, features that are overfitted, right? <clears throat> in other words, in this case, what does it tell you? 
we actually want more larger zero images. Okay? So your training set actually have too many small zero images. Question? Yeah, so how do you pick these two like uh, input images, right? One is the, so you're given these two? Uh, so uh, when you have the, uh, when you have the, your model, you know which label you have this kind of underfitting and uh, overfitting bug, right? Yes. Then we compute the, the heat map for that corresponding output label. Okay. So for example, I know that uh, this model is not performing well on, on output label zero, right? Yeah. The, yeah. It's kind of the symptom we, we see, right, in debugging. He's asking if the zeros are given. Oh, oh this too? Yeah. All oh, right, right. So, so yeah, we have different way of getting this. One is that we can use GAN to generate new new input, and then we select them. And the other, actually, we can we can select this uh, kind of a sample from the preserve uh, test cases. Okay, I'll get to that when I talk about evaluation. <laughs> so after you have a differential heat map, the input selection actually is quite straightforward. So basically, for each new input i, we feed it through the feature model. The feature model essentially is the model that I just uh, talked about. You freeze the, the number of layers, then you, you introduce a new output layer. So, but we do not run through this uh, upper layer. We simply just acquire a feature value vector v. And then we use the uh, dot product of v with the differential heat map as the score. What does it mean? Intuitively, the differential heat map tells you the most promising direction to, to fix the problem, right? When you have a dot product, it actually tell you the contribution of that particular input along that direction, right? The larger the score, and then actually it's uh, uh, easier for you to fix the problem with using that test case. Okay, let's, let me move on to the evaluation. So we uh, interesting in solving, uh, answering three research questions. The first one is the how effective and efficient is mode in fixing model bugs, and how does mode compare to using random samples or 40 samples to fix model bugs, and then what is the impact of uh, some of these design parameters. In the uh, first experiment, we actually use uh, three data sets, the digit recognition, the min, uh, the misstep, and then the fashion icon recognition, the FM set, and then the object recognition, the cipher set. <clears throat> and then we train uh, with a batch of 2,000 samples and we kept in 20,000 and four hours for small models and 40,000 samples in 24 hours for large models. We partition the original data set in 30% training, 10% validation, 10% uh, test, and 50% bug fixing. Okay, here this is important because uh, we kind of inject the bugs, okay? for the experiment one, because we reserve 50% of your, your test case. We're not using them for training as a sample. But later, I'm gonna show you, example, uh, show you the result on the pre-trained models. For this one, we kind of uh, have a suboptimal model to begin with. Right? <clears throat> for each model, we select an underfitting or overfitting bug. Underfitting, we basically uh, use the upper label with the lowest training and test accuracy. The overfitting, we use the label with the good training accuracy, but the lowest uh, uh, test accuracy. So th this is data for a miss set. The first column tell you the, the model and then the size. The second column tell you the bug type. And then this one, this two column tell you the accuracy. This is the overall model accuracy and this is the label accuracy. Label accuracy is the one that we select uh, that have the buggy behavior, okay? You can see that they are not as high as what you expect because we only use 50% of the data, data, okay? And then this column tell us the result of our technique. Here, we, the first number tell, tell us how many selected samples we used. And then to avoid overfitting, we actually mix them with the uh, random input. So we use 1,000 selected input and 3,000 random input. Mix them and put into the, the well, this is the training time, and this is the accuracy of the model after using our technique. And the next few columns tell you the, the result when you use the randomly selected input from the GAN models. The last two tell you the accuracy improvement when you simply just use the failing samples. So a few observations. Our technique actually substantially improved the accuracy of your, the original model. Right. So when you use random selected input, you can also improve the accuracy, but the improvement is not as substantial as our technique. In addition, the time and the, the sample that you need to, to achieve such improvement is much larger, much substantial than our technique. Okay. <clears throat> so the last two columns tell you that if you simply just put the failing in input into a training set, I mean, it doesn't improve. Okay, and sometimes actually degrades the performance. And this one is the, the result for the fashion icon recognition. I think it's the similar, I will skip it. 
And this is the result for Cypher. Uh, some of the, the model are actually pretty large, 20 million, right? Uh, so result, the training time for our technique actually is uh, longer, and you know, some of them require 12 hours, but compared to the random selection actually require 24 hours. But look at the numbers, the improvement, right? It's still, our observations still hold. Uh, our technique actually is still the, the best. And then the second experiment, we are not using the GAN samples. We uh, actually try to select samples from the preserved set. Here we use a three large uh, data set. Um, the face recognition, object uh, uh, detection, and the age classification. Again, the, the results similar, right? Our improvement is substantial compared to the others. And this, this experiment, actually, we are not injecting bugs. We uh, try to improve pre-trained models. We download a set of models online, and then they actually have a pretty good uh, starting accuracy, right? You can see that 95% and 87%, right? And after our technique, we are able to improve them. Like 95 to 97, 93 to 96, and then 87 to 92, right? In comparison, it uses random sample and, and you're not getting a substantial improvement as what we have. Uh, so this one actually tell you the, uh, the, the effect of mixing different ratio of samples. Uh, due to the time limitation, I skip this one. I will quickly, um, you know, go through the second thing that I want to talk about. So the second thing I want to talk about is how do we actually look into the internals of a neural network to defend against uh, adversary samples. We already have, uh, you know, know what's adversary sample. You perturb the image, then you cause uh, misunderstanding or misclassification, right? In this case, uh, you know, you perturb the image of uh, uh, Isla Fisher, and then it got recognized as uh, A.J. Buckley, right? <clears throat> uh, oops, uh, what happened? Okay. So, and that there are a lot of existing attacks, and this actually, this slide tell you the samples of all these different attacks, and then, uh, for example, you could put a glass on someone's face, and then also throw off the, uh, the, the neural network, right? And then you can put a little, little tag on someone's face, and also cause misclassification. And then the whole idea of our technique is that, you know, if you send these two pictures to the human, right? One is the original one, the other is perturbed one. So do you think the human would get the misclassification? No, because of what? Why? Because the human make that decision based on these uh, features, eyes and nose and mouth, right? So basically, the overarching uh, idea of our technique is that we try to check if the classification result of the model mainly based on the human perceptible attributes. If yes, we think that the model is reasoning. If no, the, the model is guessing. Right? It's using gut feeling, it's not doing reasonable judgment. So then we say that, okay, the, the result is not trustable. <clears throat> and then the idea is as follows. Uh, given the input, which is the human face, and then we use the existing lemma generation to identify the, the features of the face. And then after that, we use human efforts, human efforts, okay? We still need human effort here to tell you this is the left eyes, this is the right eyes, and blah, blah, blah. And we annotate them. So after that, we apply analysis to determine all the attributes that have strong correlation, uh, all the features or neurons that have strong correlation with the attributes, okay? So uh, uh, strong correlation, I will define that in a bit, but it's something to think of, a, they have a one-to-one -one mapping between the two, right? And after that, we kind of enhance this so-called attribute witness neurons, okay? Enhance their activation values, and then we downplay the, the, attribute, uh, the activation value for the other neurons, kind of like suppressing your gut feelings and enhance your reasoning capability. Right? And then um, we have two models. We compare the result. If it's inconsistent, we say that it's a, it's a, it's a attack. So now the, the real contribution actually lies in how we, how we compute the um, um, correspondence between the features and the uh, uh, attributes, right? <clears throat> So we actually introduced the so-called bidirectional reasoning, and along the forward direction, we want to determine that the attribute changes, for example, change in the nose, because the neuron activation changes. This is what people typically do, right? When they do sensitive analysis, they change the input image and see what, what activation value change uh, uh, can, in, can be incurred. However, we also do this, in addition, we also do this backward uh, analysis. We want to see the neuron activation changes also lead to the attribute changes. Okay, so when you have this uh, two direction, you essentially establish some kind of strong correlation between the two. Okay, however, you look at this. This one's not really uh, doable in practice. How do you 
you know, ensure this kind of uh, relation. So then we perform a covalent analysis. We want to see that no attribute changes will lead to no neural activation changes. Okay, this is equivalent to what, what this one is. And then once we apl apply this two kind of analysis, we should be able to get the strong activation. So um, to overview, basically you have the image. And then for the forward direction, we keep the guy's face, replace his nose in the, with the, uh, many other people's nose. Okay? Then we observe the, uh, the neuron changes. Here you cannot simply just blank out that nose because uh, if you do that, essentially you are looking at a feature of the presence or absence of the, the nose, right? But we, what we want to do, we want to get the features like the skin color, the shape of the nose and stuff, the absence of presence of nose, okay? So this is one, one way. And the other way, uh, remember that we want to show, show that no uh, attribute changes lead to no activation changes. So we keep the guy's nose, we change the entire face. Okay, and then we change different faces, and then we identify the, the, the neuron that actually are not changing. All right. <clears throat> After that, we do intersection and identify the, the the neurons. Okay, we call them the attribute uh, uh, attribute witness, and then you basically enhance the the witness activation value, and then downplay the the other one. So let me quickly go to the evaluation. Uh, we use, uh, this one is really focused on face recognition, and then we use one of the, the uh, state-of-art face recognition model, VGG face, it has 16 layers and with uh, pretty high accuracy. Then we use the three data set, and then we actually reproduce uh, seven attacks, including the patch glasses and L0, L2, L infinite, right? And the first experiment tell you the number of uh, attribute witness we have identified. This one, the first row tell you the different, uh, different layers, and this one tell you the different numbers of neurons in individual layers, and this row tell you the corresponding witness neuron we have identified for each layer, okay? You can see that even though you have a lot of uh, neurons here, only a few of them correspond to some of these uh, important features, uh, important uh, attributes, okay? And some of the layers, actually, you don't have this so-called unique uh, attribute uh, witness because of they are really not unique for individual um, uh, attributes. They are kind of like a fusing the different uh, attributes. And to, to validate that our features uh, actually are kind of witnessing the attribute, we do a simple experiment. We try to use the, the activation value of the witness um, to predict the presence of the corresponding attributes. So basically we look at the, the attribution, uh, the look, elevation value of those uh, neurons, and we try to use that to predict whether the, the nose is present or the eyes is present, okay? And then we also use the last layer of, uh, of the, uh, the model, which is FC7, which is supposed to be the layer that captured the important abstract human face uh, uh, attributes. And then you can see that our model actually is much more accurate. That means uh, uh, these neurons are really doing their job. They are really corresponding to the, to the corresponding human attributes. So the last one tells you the, um, the, 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 the detection of um, our technique. You can see the last, the last one is our technique. It has only 10% false positive and very good uh, prediction, uh, kind of detection rate for the different attacks. And then the first row is a... Uh, Recent work called feature squeezing on this year NDSS, and then it actually doesn't do well on the face recognition models. It does pretty well on the mist set and all that. Okay, and then this one AS, essentially that we only use the uh, attribute, we only use the attribute substitution or the forward analysis to extract the witness. And if you do that, uh, you know you have a good detection rate for many attacks, but you have a pretty bad uh, false positive. Okay. If you simply just use the attribute preservation, again, you have a pretty bad, bad uh, false positive, okay? And in some cases, that you don't even have the good uh, detection. Now, when you combine the two, which is what our technique do, and then you can see that the result is pretty good, right? <clears throat> Let me quickly wrap up. So in conclusion, we look into the internals of AI models, provide important hints to address debugging problem and the uh, sample detection problem. And then both projects, open source on GitHub, I, I, uh, you can easily find it from our paper. And then ongoing work, we are developing more tools to fix the wide range of AI model uh, uh, box. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. People can take some questions. Maybe. Um. 
I was wondering if it's possible to measure the sensitivity, um, the, the accuracy that you gain using your technique uh, towards per perturbations in the uh, test partition. So how, how likely it is if you have a bias in the test partition, then uh, the results are significantly less accurate or the, the added accuracy is not as significant. H have you looked into that? So in some sense, our differential heat map is kind of a hint of uh, measuring the bias, right? Uh, uh, probably I didn't get your question, uh, you know. For example, if, if, if the test partition, uh, say, mm, I see, I see. It, it can have different distributions. And if, if you change the distribution, it that's could result in a different accuracy, right? Yeah, that's actually a good idea. We haven't thought about that. Potentially, yes. We can actually compute a different heat map for different uh, partitioning, and then we can do a comparison and see you know, like the differences. We know we haven't done that, but it's, a, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Thanks. Are there any other questions for Xiang Yu? Just to clarify, so for the first part, like one of the uses of this is like if you have a generative model to filter the images that you use for uh, for training. Yeah. Right. This would mm -hmm. be this would be good so that the, that you don't pollute the model with. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Right. And is this useful in a GAN setting or like in the? Yeah, that's actually setting? we use the GAN GAN uh, inputs, right? In, in our experiment, we so do. basically you train again, and then you. Uh, you, improve, you improve that training? I think this is more like an offline process. We use GAN to generate a bunch of input, and then we, we use our technique to select. I mean, we haven't uh -huh. put into a, like a loop of, uh, you know. I'm just wondering whether you can, I mean, that's more like you have a generative model trained already, and then you, yeah. but the question is whether you can improve the GAN loop itself. Yeah, yeah that's possible, I think. Yeah. Thanks. Very interesting work. On the feature model you trained, I um, don't fully understand. Is it possible that uh, um, the retraining of the feature model that does not reflect the importance of uh, certain features? Is it possible because you are um, uh, removing uh, some hidden layers, right? So um, our heat map actually is computed for each individual uh, uh, hidden layer. And then we do have a technique to select which layer are important. I haven't got time to talk about that. But regarding your question whether you may miss the important features, uh, this is difficult to say because, uh, you know, um, I can only give you the intuition. You think about the, the, feature, the feature model essentially is some kind of logistic regression, right? And then when you train it, essentially the, the, the weight that after training essentially tell you the contribution of individual, individual feature aggregation value to the output, right? And then it's supposed to reflect and the, you mean, the importance. You mean the training for the feature model, not the original model, the weight? Right, right, the, the weight after you train the feature model, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, can, my question is that that weight you train, is it possible that actually in some cases, uh, those weights do not reflect the real importance of uh, that feature or that layer. Yeah, I don't have a good answer to that. In theory, yes, possible. Um, intuitively, there's an explanation why it captured the importance. Hmm. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, let's take the other questions offline so we can speak to Xiang Yu. So let's thank Xiang Yu again, then we'll take a break. Okay.